Good evening to all you PCT supporters and mycophiles. Those are people that love mushrooms. Um, I've been observing um, and uh, photographing um, and eating mushrooms from East Hampton for more than 25 years. Um, so I have a pretty good idea of what's out there at what different times of the year. And um, we just have a great diversity. And so I'm going to show you some of those tonight. Um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and, uh, and share my passion with you tonight. Um, my passions. Uh, it, this is so much better than speaking at a planning board meeting when I'm pissed off. Let's say that. <laughs> Y'all have seen enough of that. <laughs> um, and maybe if some of you have attended my other programs, I've been doing um, walks and talks for oh, about 20 years, many at Arcadia and, and different places around the region. Um, tonight I'm going to change things up a little bit um, and, and take a look at... Um, mushrooms through the seasons. Um, but, you know, not long after I decided to go with that theme, I realized there were some change, challenges with that. Um, for one, there's probably, we don't have an exact number, but a couple hundred species of mushrooms that grow locally. And I have hundreds of photographs. So I had to make a lot of choices and, and leave some things out um, but um, the slides tonight, they've all been photographed in East Hampton, and um, they're but a cross-section of the species that grow here, and ones that you may encounter when you're outside. Um, the time consideration, of course, means that I couldn't show you many other common species, but... Uh, um, to truly give you, to give local mushrooms their due, um, I'd need an hour and a half um, of slides probably. And um, so I'm going to spare you with a shorter program tonight. Um, I hope that my slides will give you a, a greater appreciation for these amazing organisms that live on our lands throughout the year. Oh, I tinkered with the idea of doing this in a Dayton, David Attenborough voice, but <laughs> I thought it best not to dishonor him, so I won't. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and seasons have... Obviously, we all know climate change and seasons aren't what they were at one time where there was, you know, definite, this is it, today 60 degrees and it's still February. Um, and we've had an extremely mild winter. Um, so, hey, we're going to just still call them seasons. But, you know, in some ways, winter is the resting season. Um, Spring is the awakening, summer is the time for growth, and fall is shutting things down. Um, so, let's, uh, okay, let, let's talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about mycelium, which is what's in this slide here. Um, fungi are the basis for all life on Earth. How's that for an opening statement? Hundreds of millions of years ago, fungi moved from the oceans to the barren land and started breaking down rocks and creating soil. And millions of years later, plants were able to come ashore and start inhabiting the land. So we all it owe, all it owe, we all owe it to these mycelium, which, you know, they're, 
these are very soft structures, but yet they can somehow get into trees and go through trees and get into rocks and go through rocks. So pretty amazing. Um, the mycelium actually comprise the body of a fungus that may live inside that wood and also and soil. Some connect to 90% of trees and plants through the roots, exchanging information and nutrients in a symbiotic relationship. The wood wide web. <laughs> Forests are not merely a collection of trees, but super organisms. Mushrooms are the fruits, the reproductive organs of those fungi. These mycelium were in the underside of a log in the forest, and they're constantly growing, seeking out food, making connections. And thanks to the work of mycelium, our planet is teeming with life. On with the show. So, we'll still call it winter. And yeah, there are actually several kinds of mushrooms that grow in the wintertime. Let's look at a few. These are real common. Um, amber jelly. So, a family of mushrooms are jelly mushrooms. And um, so they're very soft. These particular ones, um, you know, a lot of mushrooms have very particular habitats where they like to grow. And these really favor fallen oak branches. And you could go out in the woods now and probably, you know, look at some smaller branches on the ground and you'll see these. Um, amber jelly. Witch's butter is another jelly uh, mushroom that are quite common. And they're also kind of particular because they only grow in hemlock, dead hemlock. And they can take a few different forms. You look like that, or they might look like that. No doubt if you walked in the woods, you've seen this yellow stuff. It's witch's butter. The temperature doesn't matter? Real quick question with that. The temperature in the winter? No, you know why? Because they produce their own antifreeze. <laughs> yep. Um, this is all coming down. Um, okay. I'll just let it go. <laughs> I have powers I don't even know. Um, yeah, so the mycelium, the mushrooms, they're like little chemical factories and just produce all kinds of enzymes and yeah. So they can make it through the winter, no problem. Another yellow mushroom that you might see, you might walk by a, a dead log and you see all these little yellow dots. These are about mm, an eighth of an inch across. Yellow elf cups, they're quite common. And you know, it's worth slowing down and taking a close look at things and you might be surprised at what you see. These are another, um, as many of the ones we're gonna see tonight, they're decomposers. So they're living on this dead log and the mycelium are in the log and they're breaking it down, enabling these mushrooms to go. So another one that resists the cold really well are Inoki. If you go into um, the supermarket, um, you, in the mushroom section, you can find packages of these long, white, stringy mushrooms with tiny caps. Those are enoki, but they're grown uh, indoors with a, I think it's a very high CO2 level. And, it, and they come out and they're long and stringy and white. But in the wild, they look like this. Um, they love growing on, this is an elm tree, probably their favorite place to grow. And uh, they're, again, very particular. They only grow on an elm tree that's dying and still has the bark on. Are these edible? Uh, yes, they are edible, but they, um, I'll show you a mushroom at the very end that can be confused with this that is deadly. So 
I, I'm, 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 yeah, my purpose tonight is not really to get into, you can eat this one, you get that one. That's a whole nother program. And so I mentioned a couple that are edible, but I'm, that's not my focus here tonight. This is more of a, uh, an overview, can we say. Um, the caps are, are kind of tacky. Uh, you can see some dirt that gets stuck on there. But um, you know, that, that's actually a small uh, elm stump in my yard. And I, I took this picture last fall before I ate them. Oyster mushrooms, you've seen those in the stores, I'm sure. Um, they love growing on maple trees, another decomposer of the wood. You know, if it wasn't for mushrooms, you wouldn't be able to walk in the woods because nothing would um, break down. So they perform an important function in our ecosystems. Um, there, are, uh, much, there are oyster mushrooms that grow in the summertime as well. Uh, these are ones that you find in the fall and the winter. And uh, we're getting some rain in the next, uh, tonight and tomorrow, we're getting decent rain. And I wouldn't be surprised if um, most, more in the hill towns than here, um, if you started seeing uh, oyster mushrooms popping up on maple trees, because that's, they're very cold, cold tolerant also. Um, So we're moving from winter, which was kind of short, but we're getting on to spring. Some of the first mushrooms that you might see in the spring are mica caps. They're in a family called ink caps, and ink, they're called ink caps because when they're fully mature, uh, these are mature now, but in a couple of days, these will turn into a black goopy mess. So they're called inky caps. And uh, they're called mica caps because they little, have these little white dots that looks like minerally, but it's not a mineral. It's just the way they grow. And you can find those at the base of dread, dead trees, often in large um, numbers. Um, another decomposer. Morels are probably the most famous of the spring mushrooms. We don't see as many here as they do in places like the Midwest. But um, I have found them, and I occasionally find a few every year. I used to find a lot more, but um, they, they love growing under big ash trees. But most of our ash trees now have been killed by emerald ash borers. And so uh, when the trees go, the mushrooms go too. They can uh, take many different colors from, from blonde to dark brown and gray, and they are delicious. Here's one that's growing on one of our properties next to some poison ivy. <laughs> Be careful when you're picking, yeah. Another mushroom you might see in the spring, these are small, maybe an inch across or so, but um, very colorful. You have to look closely to find them, but they're out there, or they will be. Another mushroom that you see in the early spring are these spring antelomas. So antelomas are a, a genus of mushrooms. There's genus and then species, and I won't get into the Latin names too much tonight, but that's how they're formally identified. Um, so these are in the button stage right here. Uh, I think I took this photo at our old Pascomic property last spring. And this is what they look like when they're mature, when they open up. Another mushroom that we see in the spring are dryad saddle, also called pheasant backs. Um, another wood decomposer, they grow on dead logs and they break down the wood. Um, when they're young like that, they're good to eat. When they're big like that, they're probably most appropriate for shoe repair. <laughs> they get very tough. Um, one cool thing about them is if you, if you break one open and you just smell it, it smells like watermelon rind. <laughs> and um, they can get quite large. There's a friend with a, a giant one that fell off a tree. 
um, but that's, that's another dryad saddle. The, this is a real common mushroom in the springtime called the platterful. They can be up to four or six inches across. Um, they grow on buried wood, sometimes on, on dead wood. <laughs> and another one that we see at the same time is called a fawn mushroom. Um, another one that lives on buried wood. And they, they have white gills and this brownish grayish cap. And uh, they're very plentiful and um, yeah. Well, we finished with spring. <laughs> now we're on to summer. Summer is the time where you see the colors of the flowers and the birds and the butterflies and the mushrooms. So let's look at some summer species. The largest mushroom I think that grows in our area is the Berkeley's polypore. This one is up on Mount Tom and um, they're parasitic on trees, mostly oak trees, not all, but um, they get to be two to three feet across. And they look like they should probably be growing on a coral reef and not in the forest, but that's, that's what they do. The, um, it's a very tough mushroom at this stage. So a lot of mushrooms, as you probably know from, even if you just know mushrooms that you uh, buy in the supermarket, they have gills underneath. Gills are the structures that produce spores, which is how mushrooms reproduce. But not all mushrooms have gills. They have other um, structures that they use to um, uh, make spores with. In the case of boletes, which is a, a whole family of mushrooms, and polypores, which is another big family of mushrooms, they have pores. And the pores are like tiny tubes that are packed in really, really close together, and the spores drop out of those tubes. So it's a very efficient way to have a lot going on in a small space. You know, they've been at this for millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of years, so they're pretty good at figuring out the best way to do things. Not like us. This is, <clears throat> porcinis are, um, known throughout the world. Um, they're um, a very delicious mushroom. They're in the bolete family. And I'm gonna show you some of the boletes that grow around here. And underneath the cap, the tiny pores. Um, the stem has some, um, what they call reticulation on the stalk. And um, yeah, it's one of the most delicious wild mushrooms, for sure. They like to grow, you'll often find them under conifers, so like pines, spruce trees, uh, but they also will grow in mixed woods too. And I often find them uh, that they'll have two uh, fruitings a year. So when a mushroom's growing, it's called a fruiting. And so I'll see them maybe in late June, and then they'll fruit again in September. Now all of this that I'm telling you, they fruit hand, here and they fruit then, um, it's always dependent on weather conditions. You know, we had a, a really dry year a few years back and there were no mushrooms all summer to see. But the last two years, if you remember, we've had lots of rain and lots of mushrooms. So that's what makes them happy. This is another type of bolete that I find here, the black velvet bolete. They, um, when you find mushrooms in the summertime and, and you're a forager like I am, <clears throat> and you're looking for wild mushrooms to eat, uh, you'll often find ones that are riddled with little tunnels. And those are the tunnels of fungus gnats, which lay their eggs in the soil, and then they larva tunnel up through the stalk and into the cap. For some reason, the fungus snacks don't seem to like this one. I like it, but they don't. This is another 
bolete that's common around here, separans. The painted boletes um, will grow under white pines, another particular um, mushroom habitat that they like. And um, they have uh, yellow pores underneath the cap, so they're quite colorful. These violet gray boletes, uh, they're really pretty to look at. Um, extremely bitter, um, not something that you would eat. And I know I said I wasn't going to talk about eating them, but I, I can't help it. <laughs> Frost boletes are pretty spectacular looking mushroom that we see here. Um, they have a, um, a lot of ridges on the stalk with yellow and red. The caps are like candy apple red. Um, the pores are red. They produce these... Um, they exude a, a yellow liquid that you can see underneath neath this cap. They taste like lemon. Um, yeah, they're, they're one of the more beautiful boletes, I think. The chromefoot bolete has a pretty pink cap, um, white pores, some patterning on the stalk, and this bright yellow color at the base. In, um, in paint, I think yellow is considered chrome. I'm not a painter, but I think that's right, yeah? Okay. Um, here's another one that has bright uh, yellow pores. Uh, this was at Arcadia that I took this picture. Um, they're kind of nondescript. They kind of blend in with the leaves, but when you turn them over, it's like, whoa, those are pretty. Bicolor boletes. So that's me. Um, some boletes react when they're bruised. Um, in this case, I took a little stick and I just made my initials and through it, um, it's an oxidation reaction, uh, they turn blue. So you can see on the edge of the cap here, I may have touched that with my finger, and it turned blue there. Interestingly, the pores turn blue, but the flesh inside, which is yellow, doesn't turn blue. Um, red caps and mostly red stalks that's the bicolor bolete. The sensitive bolete. Now, it isn't because you can't, you know, say bad things to it or <laughs> they're not that sensitive. No, but they're extremely sensitive to touch. So I just touch the side over here with my finger and instantly the yellow went to this deep blue color. I cut it with my um, knife and it changes color. This is not one you want to eat. There's several other kinds of boletes that will also change color. Sometimes it's useful for identification purposes. And I'm not the only one in the woods that's the old man. <laughs> this has gray pores underneath. Rusulas are another a uh, group of mushrooms that are very common in our forests throughout the summertime, and they come in a whole rainbow of colors. Uh, I think these are maybe the most beautiful, the quilted rusula. They just have this gorgeous greenish blue color to them. Um, the variable rusula can come in uh, purple colors, green, yellowish, gray, brownish, uh, many different colors. All of the rusulas have white stalks and white gills. And an another um, way that people describe them is calling them brittle, brittle gills because the gills break very easily if you um, move your finger along them. So, rusulas. And these are one of the most common mushrooms you see in the woods if you're out in the summertime red rusulas. 
Now, if you took a little taste of that, it would burn so hot, you wouldn't want to. So it's not considered a, a edible in that sense, but it's kind of interesting to see that it's, it's like super hot pepper. I don't know what happens if you cook them um, because they're not that great of a quality um, for eating. So this is a really strange one I found last year, which has two baby mushrooms growing out of the cap of this one. You know, when you get a lot of rain, there's a lot of crazy things that happen out there. And this, was, this is one you don't see very often, very rare. Reishi. Um, the Chinese call this the king of health foods. Um, some people use it medicinally. That, that's a, a whole topic for another time. Um, and the Latin name is Ganoderma, which is the genus and the species is suge. Suge in Latin means hemlock. These only grow on hemlocks, dead hemlocks, and another decomposer of um, hemlock. This is in the baby stage. So this is how they look when they're really small, probably in uh, oh, mid to late June. And then when they're mature, that's what they look like. That particular one was probably close to a foot across. Um, th another name for them is varnish conch. Um, I've made tea from them. It's extremely bitter. Not something I'm going to drink every day. So, you know, we talked about how mushrooms are breaking down dead wood, decomposing it and recycling it, the master recyclers. And so, you can't name too many organisms that you can say that about. Wax caps are another, they're small mushrooms, no more than an inch across, but very colorful. Um, I'm showing a couple of varieties here. This is one, I don't have a real name for it at the moment. And this is another. Uh, they're all very colorful and fairly small, maybe an inch to two inches across. Amanitas are another family of mushrooms that are, have many, many, uh, many different species in our area. And this particular one is kind of a classic Amanita uh, form. So you'll see these warts on the cap a ring around at the um, beneath the cap around the stalk and a swollen base that's pretty typical for most amanitas look at a few that grow around here the tawny gris grisette uh, does not have a ring around the stalk unlike many of them but it does have the, the swollen base the destroying angel you can guess from the name, is a deadly poisonous mushroom. And this is a scan that I did and um, just showing the various stages from the button to the teenage to the adult. So the way that those, we, we saw some uh, warts on the cap before, the way that those happen is when this is a little bit smaller, this particular one, it's completely covered by this sheath. And when it breaks through, as it grows, remnants of that are left on the cap. And that's what those so-called warts are, how they get there. And the ring here happens because uh, initially the gills are completely covered by a membrane. And as the cap expands, that um, membrane kind of falls away and remains on the stalk as a ring. This is what they look out in the woods. Um, they can be up to a foot tall. Um, probably mm, the best time to see them would be August and into September. And they're quite common. You can't be poisoned by touching a mushroom, so it's fine to touch them. Here's another type. 
Amanita muscaria, kind of a famous one. Uh, on the west coast, they are red with the, with the little um, uh, dots all, all over the cap. Here in the east, they're yellow, or these were particularly orange. And these were just enormous. This was a few years ago. Um, I'm not plugging Cumberland Farns, by the way, <laughs> just for size. Another one that we see a lot of here, uh, I think this picture is from Nonatuck Park, is called the blusher. And if you uh, run your finger along the stalk, you can see here it turns a reddish color. Same with the base. That gives it, some na it, gives it its, its name, the blusher. This is one of the most beautiful Amanitas, American Caesar. Um, when it's in the um, <clears throat> button stage, the cap is a beautiful red color. It has a lovely uh, pattern along the stalk, a very big skirt underneath the cap here. Um, the cap is yellow. As this matures, it turns yellowish orange and darker right in the center up there. And uh, yeah, that's, that's a pretty spectacular local mushroom. Uh, milk caps are another group of mushrooms that we see uh, many varieties of here. <clears throat> They're called milk caps because if you cut the gills, it will exude a latex. And depending on the species, it could be white, it could be clear, it could be yellow, um, which can help with identification purposes. This one's called the corrugated milky. This is called the chocolate milky. Uh, Chicken of the woods is a, a very uh, popular mushroom with beginners because it's pretty easy to identify. Uh, this is in the in, um, very young stage. I think this was in Nonatech Park. And um, it looks pretty different as it matures. Like, you know, almost all of these mushrooms look really different from their uh, immature stages to their mature stages. And it depends on if we get a lot of rain, they're gonna look a little different. And there's many environmental factors that can change the way they look, making identification challenging. This is what they look like when they're mature. Sometimes you see them in really large um, groupings. Again, they're a wood decomposer. Um, they're kind of a generalist, so they'll grow on different types of trees. And um, uh, even though they're really popular um, for beginning foragers, they are uh, the cause of stomach upset, uh, upset for some people. So if you're ever into eating wild mushrooms, the rule is you try a little bit first and you wait 24 hours and you see how your system does with it because we're all different. And if you don't react, you're good. Many types of coral mushrooms that grow in our woods in the summertime. This is called staghorn for obvious reasons. Pretty small, about mm, three inches tall, growing on dead wood. This is violet coral. You know, you don't typically see that color in the woods, but so it's always a nice thing to run across. These are called crown tip corals because they have, oh, like little crowns at the end of each of these stalks. And this is another wood decomposer. Uh, it either grows on dead logs or buried wood in the soil. This is another type of coral called Romeria. Um, yeah, and they, they do look like corals from the ocean, don't they? Chanterelles are a group of mushrooms that are very popular around the world. Um, delicious. Um, these are young chanterelles. So you might start to see them in late June. Um, if we had an exceptionally warm year, you might see them mid-June, but they're more of a summer mushroom. 
uh, and they'll grow right up until October. This is what the underside of a cap looks like on a mature one. Very beautiful. Uh, they don't have gills. These are actually ridges, um, which is uh, different than gills. But all chanterelles have ridges, like those potato chips or something. Yeah. Black trumpets um, are, mm, they appear usually in uh, mid-July, and they'll grow right up through October, typically. Um, they really like it when it's hot and buggy <laughs> and, and there's been some rain. Um, and um, many foragers would say this is their favorite wild ed edible mushroom. Um, I had some in an omelet this morning, actually. Uh, I always dry them, so... Um, yeah, I think that the last year I dried about 10 pounds that I found because there were lots of them given all the rain we had. And they can appear in great numbers if conditions are right. This is up on Mount Tom, but it could be anywhere. And they, um, they grow under oak trees and they like where there's some moss Maybe, or they like where there are areas in the forest where um, there's a little bit of a, um, a gully and the rainwater washes down there. It's called a wash. And they like it, areas like that that, that get a, a good shot of rain when we have a storm. They have a lovely fruity smell. Cinnabar chanterelles. The last year was a big year for them. The, the flesh inside is white, and the outside is this beautiful reddish-orange color. Um, I saw a lot in Nonotoc Park last year. Um, sometimes mushrooms, like other growing things, you know, will have a big year one year and then not so many the next year. But it's, it's quite dependent on rainfall. Jack-o'-lanterns, they look a little bit like chanterelles, but they're not. Um, there's some differences, what I won't, I won't get into, but the cool thing about jack-o'-lanterns and how they get their name is they, they're bioluminescent. We have a couple of different mushrooms that are bioluminescent, meaning they glow in the dark. So these, if you brought these inside into a darkened room, you would see a greenish white light coming from them. It's pretty cool to see. Um, and every year I see clumps of them underneath. It's an oak tree in front of Florence Savings Bank by the rotary. <laughs> see these big clumps of yellow mushrooms. That's what, those are jack-o'-lanterns. Um, they're poisonous, in case you were wondering. And they, I, I think they can be confused by beginners as chanterelles. I almost made that mistake a long time ago, but. They're very different in many ways. Martin, yes. Is there a reason they grow in the dark? You know, they've never really come up with a, a good reason. I think it's been theorized that it's to attract insects, but insects cause to mushrooms anyway. Um, so we're not sure really what the the real reason that they glow in the dark is. But it's it's not that uncommon. Uh, all around the world, there are species that glow in the dark. Licorice drops grow on dead oak logs. Um, weird little guys, maybe an inch across. Um, fairly common. And peanut butter cups, another type of cup fungus. Um, these grow on um, the forest floor. Uh, again, Nonotuck Park, um, where they're pretty common in the summertime. And they kind of blend in, so you have to look clear, cl closely. Here's a be beautiful summer mushroom, the purple lacaria. <clears throat> the top is kind of a tawny um, color, brownish, light brown, tan color. And underneath is just these spectacular purple gills. Turkey tails, very common mushroom. Uh, another wood decomposer. Um, and they come in many different colors. So here's a couple of variations here. 
they might have blues and greens and, and browns and grays and they're, they're very pretty. And obviously they like this tree here and they're working at breaking it down and recycling it. And you can find those everywhere in the forest. You won't find them in your bathroom. False turkey tails, they look somewhat similar. They're a little different though. Um, and this one over here, you often see them with this green color on them, which means they're cohabitating with algae. Um, so I'm not sure uh, what the advantage is to that, but there must be some because it's, it's pretty common to see. They're, um, they're thin, they're almost like cardboard. Um, you can go out and find last year's on logs now if you were in the woods. Um, a common purple species that you see in the summertime is Cortinarius iotes. Uh, the cap can be kind of tacky, um, and as they mature, they develop these uh, tan colors in the purple, and it might look like that. Beautiful. Stinkhorns, anatomically correct. Um, this one is the phallus stinkhorn, and this is the dog stinkhorn. You can fill in the blanks. Um, the way that stinkhorn, stinkhorns um, function is that they, um, this is very kind of um, tacky up here, and it smells like rotten meat which attracts, attracts insects, flies mostly, to land on them. In doing so, they get the spores on their feet and spread those spores around. And they, they do smell pretty nasty. They often will be found in growing in um, piles of wood chips. Autumn, yes. Maybe we'll have an autumn this year, who knows. One of the most common um, mushrooms you might see in the fall are puffballs. You could probably see them starting in August and going right into um, October. There's a few different varieties of puffballs that we have here. This is probably the most common one. Um, if you cut them open, it's pure white inside. They feel kind of like a marshmallow with that consistency. These are called gemmed puffballs. Pretty common also. And a pear-shaped puffball. Giant puffballs, we call them giant when they're bigger than softball size. And I have found a couple that are bigger than a um, soccer ball. So that they can get enormous. And um, if they're pure white inside, they're okay to eat. And you could, uh, you could slice open one of these big ones, slice it up, put some tomato sauce and cheese on top. You got a mushroom pizza <laughs> without the mushrooms. Whoops. This is a, probably the strangest of puffballs, uh, also called puffballs in aspic. <laughs> aspic is a clear jelly. Uh, disgusting. I don't want to talk about it too much. <laughs> but anyway, uh, another name for these is hot lips. Uh, um, this is up in Mount Tom and um, strange, very alien looking. They're about three inches tall. Dyer's poly polypore. Now, this isn't one that if you touch it, you're going to keel over but it is used by people who use mushrooms to dye wool. And there are many different mushrooms that um, some people use to dye wool, different colors. This will produce um, yellows, browns, um, and, and a few other colors I'm, I read. I have a friend in uh, North Carolina, a mycologist who wrote a book about dyeing with mushrooms, dyeing, not dying, dying, but <laughs> <laughs> dyeing wool with mushrooms. <laughs> And um, she talks about the many species that can be used for that. And these 
grow um, around conifer trees and they rot the roots. So like um, several of the mushrooms that are out there, um, they're pathogens. They're not doing good things. Um, mushrooms like we looked at the boletes earlier, all of the boletes are what are called mycorrhizal mushrooms, which means that their mycelium are connected to tree roots. And they're exchanging nutrients with the trees in a symbiotic relationship. So the mushrooms are giving the trees minerals, which the trees can't get very well on their own. And in some cases, they're getting them water. And in return, they're getting sugars and carbohydrates because mushrooms don't, uh, can't make their own. Unlike plants that can photosynthesize and make their own energy, um, mushrooms can't do that. So they connect with the trees and they get the sugars for them and that enables them. Every, every living thing needs energy. And so that's how they get theirs in ex this exchange underground with the trees. And if, if you look at microscopic pictures, you can't tell where the true be tree begins and the, the roots of the tree begin and the mycelium end. They're just so interconnected. It's really like, well, I mentioned super organism. So, yeah. Lion's mane, if you went into the co-op, you could buy these fresh. They're grown in South Deerfield. Um, uh, some people eat them from, um, for um, medicinal purposes. Um, so there's a few mushroom species. Instead of having gills or pores, um, they have these soft projections that are called teeth. And these are two of the teethed, toothed uh, species. Um, the bear's head tooth, it looks like a frozen waterfall. They're very beautiful. Um, these, like, this is growing on a, uh, a, probably a dead beach, which is one of their favorite places to grow. Sometimes you'll find them on maple trees. Another toothed mushroom that appears in the fall are hedgehogs. Um, there's two varieties that grow around here. One is larger than this one. This is called the belly button because it has a, a dimple in the center of the cap here and sweet tooth because mm, they're pretty delicious. And those, um, oh, I found them into no, oh, November, so they can uh, tolerate cold pretty well. And um, Hen of the Woods is another one that you can find commercially. Um, this is another one that's a pathogen. Uh, it's a, uh, uh, what's the word I want? Um, parasite, that's it. It's a parasite, mostly on oak trees. Uh, at our Mudders Field property, if you've been there, you may notice <clears throat> last year a, a very large oak tree came down on the other side of the trail, close to the trail. And that's a, an oak tree that for many years I found these mushrooms growing at the base of it. Well, um, Besides just growing there, they were rotting it out from the inside. And eventually, that mighty oak fell over because of those little mycelium. So they'll often come back, like a lot of mushrooms, in the same place year after year until the food supply runs out. But if you look under large oaks in the fall, you're likely to find them, if you can see them, because they do blend in pretty well. These are another really um, pretty one, the green elf cups. And uh, <clears throat> quite small, maybe a half an inch, quarter of an inch across. And you often have to turn over a log to see the actual caps. What you might see more often is pieces of dead wood in the forest that has this blue-green color to it. And that's the reason the mycelium of these mushrooms are inside of this wood and they dye it that color. So it's always kind of fun to turn over a log and see those because they're so pretty. We don't see that color in nature very much. Do you see the wood more than the mushrooms? I'm sorry? Do you see the wood 
that greenish wood more than you see the you, Yes, you absolutely do. Yeah. yeah. Um, these fro fruit in, um, oh, probably from October through December. Foliotas are another um, beautiful species, another wood decomposer. Um, we have a couple different varieties here. This is one of them. These are called late fall oysters. There's a mushroom hanging from the ceiling that's in the way there. Uh, that's not a mushroom. Uh, so they're not a true oyster, and they differ from, these are true oysters, they differ from them in that <clears throat> the gills are uh, yellowish, yellowish greenish underneath. Um, these are white underneath the gills. These don't have a stalk. These have a short stalk. Um, so they're completely different species, but they're called late fall, fall oysters, and they're not nearly as tasty as the real oysters. But they're one of the latest mushrooms to come out in the fall. Another one that you might see after the weather gets really cold are shaggy manes. Um, they're in the inky cap family, and you can see this one, it's just reached its peak and it's about to turn into a black goopy mess. And if you were to collect them, you have to eat them pretty quick because they don't last long. Um, they break down pretty quickly. And they are commonly found growing on lawns. I think these were, um, yeah, non-stuck non park. Um, another decomposer that's beautiful is the cinnabar polypore. Um, another very um, particular mushroom in that it only grows on black birch, dead black birch. So it's decomposing these birch logs here. The top is, you know, kind of orangey color, but when you turn it over, whoa, gorgeous. And brick caps are another late fall mushroom that can tolerate the cold very well. Um, another decomposer. The caps are kind of orangey, reddish, and underneath, um, when the caps are mature, the gills turn uh, to this grayish color. You'll see them in large numbers sometimes at the base of stumps. Honey mushrooms are a, um, a pathogen on live trees, meaning they kill trees. And they will grow in large numbers. Um, you can see in this photograph here just how many in a small area. Uh, there's a, a two or three varieties, maybe four, that grow in our area. Um, this is called the ringless honey mushroom. These have little rings around the, uh, the stalk. Um, and they'll start appearing in, um, in August, late August, and go into September. But when, if you walk in the woods in, say, early September, you're likely to see large numbers of honey mushrooms. Slippery caps. These are ones that pro, uh, uh, John Bader probably ate when he was picking mushrooms. Um, they're called slippery caps because when it's a, a little wet, the caps are kind of slippery. They have pores underneath, so in the, they're in the bolete family. <clears throat> These are called dotted stalk, um, well, the real name is dotted stalk swillus, which is their um, uh, genus. And they grow underneath pine trees, common in, in um, oh, these, is, these are in Nonatuck Park again. Um, very common. There's a few different varieties of slippery caps. And uh, we have to mention this one, which looks, um, if you were looking for enoki mushrooms, which we showed much earlier in the spring, um, these come out in the fall. Their Latin name is Gallerina autumnalis, um, which indicates that they like to grow in the fall. 
And the way that you can tell them is it has a little tiny ring. You have to look really closely at these to see that ring. Best to avoid small mushrooms if you're into foraging. Just don't bother with little brown mushrooms. So I suggest that you start when you're out in your walks in the woods, that you slow down. You start seeing instead of just looking. You know, if you look, you just see, well, with plants, you know, you see this, oh, shades of green, shades of green, as opposed to slowing down and saying, oh, look at that amazing plant or this amazing plant. Same with the mushrooms. So, you know, sometimes it's fine to rush. Other times it's very rewarding, rewarding to slow down and see what's happening at your feet. And uh, thank you for listening. I have time for questions if you have any.